In the mid-60s, Betty Freeman showed up at the Pasadena Art Museum where Harry was giving a lecture demonstration and was totally charmed by this person. And uh, Harry charmed the whole of Pasadena society. And she quickly uh, became a supporter of his. And she um, underwrote a performance of Parch's latest work he was writing, The Delusion of the Fury, she underwrote a performance at University of California, San, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA. They said that they wouldn't sponsor it. They could only sponsor it if I guaranteed the losses. So I made a legal document with UCLA to guarantee any losses to UCLA for this, these four per performances at UCLA. Uh, however, they were, all four were sold out. It was in a little theater at UCLA, a real small theater uh, in, the, in the drama department. So Parch went back up to Los Angeles, and uh, I was brought up there to be the Parch's assistant and conductor of the performance. And uh, so we, we performed um, not only Delusion of the Fury, but also, uh, two months before that, um, Oliver uh, Daniel at BMI got Parch a performance in New York City. And then after that, we returned, and by that time, I think that the production of Delusion of the Fury was in place. And that happened in my third year of college, so that would have been in the 68 to 69, probably spring of 69, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and that was, uh, that was a very big deal, all the rehearsals and stuff. We, we um, rehearsed uh, a lot for it. So Amor Richards in Los Angeles, um, uh, in the um, summer, of, um, uh, summer of 68 and the fall of 68, really recruited all of the wonderful musicians who, that were on Parch's first CBS recording, The World of Harry Parch. Those are all Los Angeles musicians. And then we subsequently, two months later, brought the instruments back to Sandy, uh, Los Angeles and, and, did, and rehearsed and did Delusion of the Fury. So Emil Richards is another very important person of that period that really um, made things happen and made, made things a success. And he was working on Delusion of the Fury uh, all of this time and we were playing duets, trios, quartets, sextets, octets, all based on what he wanted to do with delusion. I can't do it in a really satisfactory way that is. Tell you why there's no play which is so serious and religious in a sense, goes with this African farce. But to me they did. And I can recall, oh, let's see, uh, at least two years before I started writing it, I was talking to somebody at UCSD about it, and I was saying that it was going to start out with an overture, I call it an exordium, introduction to a statement, a philosophical statement, and uh, the no play was going to be followed by an entr'acte, and uh, then I was going into this African farce, and uh, people expect you to, to, to uh, reconcile everything in words, apparently. Yeah. I couldn't. Japan Society just called me up. They got grant, a grant from it or, or major funding, I believe, from Citibank, um, but I had nothing to do with that. They, they approached me about doing Delusion of the Fury in, in uh, February of 2005, but they were, they were discussing, even back then, doing it in December 2007. So it, it needed that much lead time, though, actually.
Madeline Tortolo was looking for an editor for the, the Delusion of the Fury and asked me if I would do that. And I did. And she came to my apartment where I had my upright moviola set up. I was editing a film on Leon, I mean, on Lightning Hopkins. Well, I, all I can remember is that she was pleasant and we had a good experience. I can't say that about all directors I've worked for, but she was uh, appreciated the things that I brought to the project and I could take her direction and did whatever she wanted me to do that I hadn't thought of doing on my own. And as far as I know, everybody was happy with what came out of it. How much uh, creative leeway were you, were you given in the past? All I wanted. She gave me the footage and I just made the best of what I could, which is all an editor can do. There wasn't impossible things. I didn't say I won't cut these two things together because they won't work. And Harry came over to look at the film. I remember him looking at it, but I can't remember what he said. And uh, I wish you'd asked me these questions back then and I could give you a pretty good interview. But right now, just all I remember the, he did come over and he did end up liking the film and uh, I shot some pictures of him, one of which is on my website. Well, I'm, I'm curious, the, 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 the film opens, uh, it opens with uh, in the uh, exordium sequence, which is the, the introduction to the piece. and. Uh, during, during this part in the music, um, in the film, there's, uh, the instruments are introduced almost as characters. Uh, and they're shown one at a time and the names. Uh, well, they're such odd, unusual instruments, it's almost required, I think, to, to introduce them. And they're fascinating in themselves. Another thing about Delusion of the Fury, you know, the two most, ex and this is the case in a lot of Harry's big works, the, t the most exciting sections musically, nothing is happening dramatically. Exordium and Sanctus are major compositions in themselves. They could stand alone on a stage and be just enormous concert pieces, each one powerful with a beginning and an end and, and a total effect in and of itself, and they take place in parts of the piece that are absolutely static, abstract sections, in other words. So, um, because exordium, you can call it a web, the, 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 the weaving of the web that introduces the rest of it, but what is the audience actually thinking about during exordium? They, they don't know the story yet, they don't know anything corporeal, they haven't seen a single person, um, the, the musicians should be in costumes, but, but still, the, the primal effect of what they're doing is listening to a beautiful and powerful piece of music that has absolutely no extra musical um, effects added to it at all.
in Delusion of the Fury, to me, one of the most troubling aspects of it is that Harry is a composer who states very definitely that he, that first of all, it's a dance theater work and that he believes that dance should not be abstract. It should always be telling a story. But the way he presents the story in the first act of Delusion of the Fury, there's absolutely no way that the uninformed audience member will even have an idea what that story is and be able to even know what those characters are, what their relationship are. Surely it's not um, the correct thing to do to put a super title up there that says, A Son in Search of His Father's Face. Um, so how do, you, how do you let the audience know who, who these people are, or does it really not matter? And it's a ritual of dream and delusion, and the audience is dreaming and deluded through it. Because there's no way of doing that. And, it, and to me, it, bo it bothers me because it seems like a clear violation of his own principles. And yet, there it is in the work, and, and no real way around it. I do not trust any modern company doing them because they're all trained as specialists. And a singer is not an actress, although to some extent now they're, they're beginning to be, but uh, not the way I would like to see them. Of course, I'd like to see musicians be actors, and, and in delusion, we got it to some extent. And also dancing, because on the bass marimba, the player has a six foot uh, uh, riser to move on. The uh, boo player, the Babu Marimba, he has a six foot stretch to operate in front of. The Kathara, this one, he's got a big area to work on. And uh, I really talked to these boys. They're mostly boys. I had a few girls this time. I very seldom have any women. But uh, I talked to them constantly about this. I wanted the dancing, when there is dancing, to become a part of the action of the musicians on their stands, wherever they are. 
not totally divorced. That's true in Kabuki. It's true in No Do to some extent. At least. Of course, they the musicians don't move very much in Kabuki or No. Uh, but somehow, of course, they're in costume. Somehow, there is a oneness. But in African uh, ritual, they, they they certainly are musicians. Are certainly actors. The other night I was Googling Delusion of the Fury because I'm kind of I'm curious what the ac reaction is to it and, and so I ended up on a couple different people's blogs and one person was really angry about the performance and even said there better be a goat in the score because he thought that, that the director had invented putting a goat in the person's hand. It says goat in the score. <laughs> It says that the goat woman has to walk out with the goat and it's got to make the sounds. So we were following the score religiously.
What I know of Harry's um, dissatisfaction with the performance comes more from reading what he wrote afterwards than from being aware on a first-hand basis of how unhappy he was at the time. But apparently he was extremely unhappy with certain aspects of the production, the costumes, the, the, um, the, just the, what the choreographer decided to do about the dancing. Um, uh, the I guess the integration of the musicians he and you know and if if we're going to be fair though some of the blame I think belongs to Harry also because often in his work he would um, he would concentrate on the musical aspects of it so greatly that the dramatic things would be out of his control and he wouldn't even know what they were going to be until it was too late to do anything other than complain violently about them. Um, I'm a little unhappy with our production from the visual standpoint, but I'll take the blame for it. It's not because I only found out about it three days before. Um, it's because uh, certain, th certain things I just didn't have control over the way I thought I was going to and they didn't develop the way I thought they were. And um, 
I'll, I'll take the blame. As far as direction and choreography? As far as, far as the direction and, and choreography and, and um, I, I would have liked to have had a lot more integration between it, a lot more coaching of the band and stuff and it just never, in this production for one reason or another it didn't happen. The, the director and the choreographer were much more concerned with what was happening in front of us than with us. Well, that was a fiasco having to do with the costume or who made costumes, um, uh, kept delaying all of us saying, I'm working on the costumes, I'm working on the costumes. When she finally showed us what the costumes were, um, we hated them it, universally. The musicians did, the choreographer did, the director did, and, and we, not only the musicians' costumes, but the dancers' costumes, and we had about four days to solve the problem, and the decision had to be made, and it was a difficult one, it was that four days was enough to make the two costumes each for the dancers that were necessary, but not enough time to do anything that would be worth doing for the musicians. But, the, but the, the fact that the costumes came out so badly became, in, in my mind, almost like a symptom of the failure of the production, that, that we weren't getting the integration of the chorus and the, and the, um, the principles in the, to the level that I thought the piece called for. We didn't in 1969 at all. So the, it, it, even though we got into it just a little in this production, it was more than had happened in 1969. There was absolutely no integration in the original performance, none whatsoever.